Greetings from Slovenia. <laughs> uh, greetings. Yeah. yeah. How are you? All good? Yeah. Yeah. Very low key day today, Samo. Yeah. Very good. low. Key. Yeah. It snowed um, where we are overnight in the half oh. of the day today. So I was shoveling things and uh, just now I'm having a beer. Oh, cheers. Me too. <laughs> oh, fantastic. <laughs> See, that's yeah. good. But man, th thanks for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Oh, no problem. Yeah, my pleasure. I think I've done these talks now with almost everyone you've played with. So, Oh, oh my God, the, the list that uh, I, I guess you sent it. Wow, that's a that's an amazing, <laughs> huge and, and a list of yes, many people that I at least know. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it, it's become like an obsession. I started during the COVID, and I was like, yeah, it got a little bit out of hand, but okay. <laughs> but well, you know, a lot of people in there uh, in a pretty short amount of time. Yeah, yeah, I love doing this. You know, I mean, uh, I play music obviously and compose and everything, but just like to hear you guys talk about you know how you started and i don't know if i listen to tim burn or whoever like just or scott you know or who you played with well, like. i'm happy i'm happy to talk about all that stuff because i don't get asked about it all that often you know mostly it's either wilco stuff which is expected and it's fine but or just guitar yeah. geek stuff you know yeah i really and don't so i, I don't want to go into guitar geek stuff actually i mean <laughs> And even Wilco, uh, I, I said to myself, no Wilco questions today. You know, it's like well, I had a feeling looking at your list, I had a feeling that that was going to happen. And so I'm really I'm completely stoked, as we say, uh, <laughs> those of us from California, I guess. Yeah, no, but you, you, you know, I've listened to your music for such a long time. And, uh, you know, obviously I, I know you from Wilco and but I have you more more I known you from other records before you know before i even came aware that you played in wilco i, I didn't even know actually to be honest then because i followed I your <laughs> <laughs> yeah i followed I this was true in your case no yeah, but it's true really it's like you know i followed your career of course as an improvising jazz musician and then then i stumbled upon the wilco records i was like man shit this is amazing of course also but uh you know, I remember hearing the singers for the first time like many years ago, and I was just amazed. And you know, that then... started a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, and I, I wanted to ask you about Share the Wealth first, and uh, just okay. jump in in this question of uh, you know, I've no, no, known your music for a long time, you as a composer also, and like uh, you have such a wide range of. Uh, compositions going back to that like the late 80s i think it was angelica right uh and the early 90s records like your range, range as a composer is so wide like how do you approach a record and let's say this last uh, record when you start composing what what's the process there uh well um interestingly um in the case of share the wealth it's very different mm -hmm. from uh other things i've done because i it was so I was barely prepared at all. <laughs> really? Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, because this, this particular configuration had never even played together before. And I booked two days uh, in Brooklyn to see just what we would come up with. And I wrote a few things, but they're really mostly very sketchy. And my goal was to record a lot of improvising to click tracks that I was later going to edit uh, and collage maybe even uh with eli cruz who uh worked on the record with me we were gonna you know i was gonna start dissecting it and then i really ended up liking these improvised sections um yeah they're killing a yeah. lot so uh 
so um so i didn't in any way intend to make a double record for example or a record where there's a 17 and a half minute track or anything like that uh, it just ended up being something that i was really enjoying listening to uh and then it was just a, a matter of fitting it well of course then i i had to send it to don was and then mm. he said yeah let's do this um i thought he would say like wow this is a cool record now but it's not a blue note record yeah you know? exactly yeah so so blue note has licensed my work the last three records so basically I, none of them uh while i was making them uh was i aware of making a blue note record or anything you know it's just gonna see if don likes it <laughs> So that's what that session was. And so uh, I, I did a whole lot of notes, note taking uh, about edits and mutes and things like that to just sort of like polish the turd or whatever. <laughs> and, and, yeah. and, uh, but, the, but I didn't change the, in terms of the improvised uh, pieces, I didn't change the uh, sequence of events, if you will. I didn't change the, the, the sort of the, the journey yeah. uh sort of trimmed it here and there um or featured a whole like uh, uh the pleather patrol is just a featured section of of something we did where i really liked just that section yeah um but it was just once again it was an improvised uh piece to a click track you know mm. using the one that ended up being called uh stump the panel which is track four yeah uh completely improvised piece uh scott forgot to turn up his click uh on that and start playing this whole other time and all this other stuff happened and we we're all just wondering the rest of us like what the hell's going on and so he just turned the click down in our mix and then just and then that was a, almost a half hour of improvising um that i sort of trimmed down to 17 plus minutes <laughs> yeah and then pieces like uh, but like uh, nightstand let's say how, how I, okay. I love the melody on nightstand let's say how, how do you approach it i mean how do you start usually well but see that wasn't even written for the singers it was just something i wrote because that and the last piece passed down i wrote sitting in our apartment uh after this this person i knew uh since junior high school uh and worked with um briefly in a record store uh, had killed himself so oh, okay. i was very upset um and and so I, I wrote those pieces basically thinking about him um or whatever was whatever i was feeling you know uh they're not supposed to be super melancholic or anything they're just supposed to sound uh, i guess uh somber in some way or yeah. sober i don't know i don't know what the right word is but 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 i just had the lead sheet for nightstand which didn't have a title at the time it was probably called sketch or something and showed it to uh brian and asked brian and uh Skerrick to play it play it down and then uh the duet in the middle which was me and zero uh i did later so mm, okay uh, so they were so you know we had maxed out uh the bunker studio in brooklyn with uh which is a great studio but i mean yeah. really had to put all the amps in closets and the keyboards and you go direct and then we had to reamp them later and do things like that because uh the space especially with with you know brian has a lot of keyboards which is one of the things that he's there to do is play a bunch of his cool keyboards <laughs> um, and then there's zero you know with his his setup and uh yeah. So anyway, so I did things in sections sometimes. I guess is my point. Yeah, but like, <laughs> and I mean, then, it, and then put it together later. Like, uh, does it write music? I, I mean, you know, when I look at the records I have of you at home, of you, yours as a band leader, you've written a lot of music. You know, does, does writing music seem? Does it well, come easy for you, or do you have like a sketchbook or like? No, it doesn't come. It doesn't come easy. But it's it's not something I try to do all that often. You know, I'm always afraid if I write something, then I'll have to remember how to play it. Um, so I don't write nearly as much as is in my creative imagination, where especially when I used to drive a lot. Yeah. Well, I'm driving a lot again now that I'm living in upstate New York. But uh, 
a whole entire albums would come to me like themes and everything that I could remember for like the uh, if, if I was driving very frequently from Los Angeles to uh, the San Francisco Bay Area mm -hmm. or or the other way back and forth um, I would sometimes have entire albums that I could remember for hours um, but then never wrote a yeah. note uh, <laughs> but anyway uh, but I was going to say that it, that as opposed to Share the Wealth, which was an experiment with this apparently unschedulable band. I don't know if we'll ever play a live gig. <laughs> um, uh, I hope so. Yeah, uh, nice, yeah. Angelica, which you mentioned, the first record that's just yeah. my name, uh, was highly considered. Uh, there's virtually nothing random about the, any of the writing or any of the conceptualizing. I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I was a lot younger than... I knew I was going to have Tim, Stacy, Alex, and Eric, and yeah. uh, and I wrote. I mean, I had a whole vision of it. No, at that time, that record was supposed to address, in some way, or at least uh, reflect. I guess is a better word. Uh, certain things I loved about, uh, I guess, what you would say is a little more conservative uh, sonic palette, like more more traditional, in some ways, and. Uh, and then I was going to do a uh, like sort of like a trilogy or whatever, yeah. a, a triptych um, of three releases. And the third one was going to be what ended up being Silencer by my trio, because I was going to lead a, sort of a timeline of aesthetic, a, an aesthetic trail. <laughs> I was going to leave an aesthetic trail to this more kind of rock power trio-ish um, work. You know, which was also once again like very specifically uh, designed to be with those players. You know what I mean? It's like yeah. I knew who I was playing with, so uh, and and uh, they were willing to do what I asked, so <laughs> which was liberating. But do you usually write for the players? I mean, uh, let's say, yeah. I think I have to have a reason, you know, the because yeah. the rest of the time I'm just writing stuff on the guitar. And to me, after a while, some of it just starts sounding completely the same. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I have, have the same. Yeah, shit. Yeah. I love these chords or I love this kind of thing or this groove or whatever, you know. Um, but in the case of my current uh, improviser band that is that is actually playing as opposed to the singers, which can't seem to convene, um, concentric quartet, um, which I'll at some point, I guess, record, but, uh, and that's uh, very much, the, the writing is basically about these people and how they play. There's one piece that I think isn't really great for a saxophone because there's no room to breathe. So, uh, and I knew that when I wrote it, but I just really wanted to try to play it. I, I don't I'm not sure that saxophone is, uh, it's not realistic. It's, that's bad orchestrating on my part. Um, but um, but yeah, it's been very specifically composed uh, for these people. But at this, but I also wanted it to change. So I'm yeah. looking forward to trying to play more. It's another very hard thing to schedule. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. The band is with uh, Ingrid Laubrock on saxophone, Tom Rainey on drums, and Chris Lightcap on acoustic bass. Yeah, your man Chris and. Uh, uh and yeah we're we're just trying to I, I want it to become more about who's playing and less about what i wrote i guess is something i want to say yeah yeah and especially uh, uh, how important are uh, uh, you know i've played with tom so many times i did so many records with oh, sorry. Tom, Ra tom rainey we, we we toured together a lot and you know okay, you're oh you hear me Samo. okay no Samo, you're breaking up Okay, try again. Start again. I heard the word the, the words Tom Rainey come out of your mouth, and that's about it. <laughs> no, I want to start say, over, like, please. Uh, I, I've played with Tom so many times, and you know, recorded uh, and, and toured with him, and he's for me one of the most creative drummers. And you seem to have this relation with drums. You know, with Scott, when I hear you together, it's like amazing. Or with Greg Bendy and like amazing. Or you know, I love what you guys did also. And but how well, come... I, I, it comes from Alex Klein. Yeah. I mean it's it all comes from playing with my uh identical twin brother most of my growing up, actually my whole growing up pretty much and beyond, um, who's just a badass. 
you know, oh, and yes, so, yeah. and a lot of time spent sitting around with Alex and uh, back way back then, the drummer from my first trio, Michael Preussner, and listening to to records and just going on and on about Tony Williams and Elvin and Jones and Jack DeJunette and, you know, in, in certainly in my brother's case, P Frank Perry or Pierre Favre and, uh, yeah, I just think I think a lot about the drums. I do really did, like, since, since I like the to have a very strong identity. Yeah, I mean, was this the first time you played with Tom? Actually, Rain, you know, because I don't, I don't know. I have you on records. Or any uh, we did. I formed an improvising trio. Oh yeah, forever ago with Tom and Andrea Parkins. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And we even. Played we even toured Europe at one point. We had two recordings: one, um, a studio recording on that from on Atavistic, yeah, and yeah. Uh, and a live recording from uh, Victoriaville Festival. Yeah, I remember now. Yeah, but uh, yeah. I wanted to ask you about your growing up with. Uh, you know, you mentioned Alex. He's a badass. You <laughs> he really is. And you know, I haven't. Uh, you know. I, I remember the first records I heard with Tim Byrne that he played, and uh, you're on one of them actually, also I think. And uh, like, how did you guys? Yeah, seven how... yeah exactly. I, I love that stuff. I listened to that today actually. That was a long time ago. So that, was, that was a really <laughs> long time. But uh, I wanted to ask you about these beginnings of you. You know, I did this talk the other day with Vinny Golia. Oh, nice, great! Another one of the most underrated players out there, I think. But like, how did you start? coming into the scene actually how, how did that begin for you well oh boy how much time do you have uh, oh man well, well, certainly, well, i have another certainly. beer in the fridge so <laughs> oh yeah i have i have fridges right here <laughs> um well vanny certainly is like one of the most important people in my life and an important factor in exactly what you're asking about um but Prior to meeting Vinny, which I think was 1975, wow, already. Wow. Okay. I was already a, a young adult by then, um, in my uh, early 20s, uh, I guess, maybe 20. But anyway, um, Alex and I were really uh, just always playing music together. And so we started out uh, in elementary school hmm. and... My brother, he was always good. Alex was just always good. And I, and I didn't even know how to tune a guitar. <laughs> but our friend Pat Pyle, uh, elementary school drummer, was super generous and let my brother play his drums all the time. And so, uh, like on maybe on a Saturday, we'd go over to Pat's house and uh, Alex and Pat would play along with Rolling Stones records. Uh, and his his uncle had a, a an Italian like a Crunicelli bass, I think it was, with a crown, little crown combo mm. amp. So I remember once or twice at least plugging that thing in and just like running my hand up and down the bass and making noise uh, while Alex and Pat switched off playing drum beats uh, along with Charlie Watts. Sorry, I have a hair stuck I don't in know, Bruce. Um, but but uh, uh, and so. Basically, we became infected, uh, Alex and I, by rock and roll and sound, you know. And if you imagine when what time period this is, yeah, you know, this is 1965, six, seven, eight. By 68, we were completely psychedelicized, you know. We, 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 not to say we were taking LSD, but to say that psychedelic music had gripped us. And, and and our creative imaginations were on fire. Uh, this, along with discovery of things like the, the surrealists, um, you know, uh, uh, the art of the absurd or whatever, like these things that we were really interested in as uh, like preteen and early teen dudes. Um, and then we moved forward from there. Like we played at our elementary school graduation, three original compositions. Wow. Um, okay. Our band, our band, homogenized goo. Um, oh my God! It's snowing again. Oh my God! Anyway, um, just noticed. Uh, and so we we just became obsessives, you know, about music, about rock and roll, and in my case, certainly um, 
uh, Indian classical music, uh, Ravi Shankar specifically. Really? Oh, wow. Okay. I didn't know that. Well, because, because I uh, heard uh, his music in my elementary school class about India, and our teacher, Miss Godlin, played an entire side of a World Pacific uh, Ravi Shankar live record with Ala Raka. And uh, I, f I completely lost it, man. I was like uh, obsessed with sitar. And and this was probably 1966. Oh, okay. Ravi Shankar had an Indian classical music school in Los Angeles, where I'm from at that time. And I thought I, was, I should take up sitar. You know? Oh, okay. But, yeah. But then, of course, the, he, the school, I think, was closed at around the time 66 maybe early 67 or something but but i read his first uh sort of rather slim uh autobiography my music my life and when i read about his the arduous training involved with learning sitar and basically have to sit with it without playing it for a year and all this kind of stuff <laughs> and how he would play eight hours a day while his fingers bled and all this and i said you know what i'm gonna play electric guitar <laughs> <laughs> you know, at least people wouldn't be, you know, making all these uh, nausea sounds like they did in my classroom. You know, like like these kids were all going like, ew, 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 ew. <laughs> all the time we were listening to this, and it was, you know, it was side one. Uh, it was at least 17, 18, 19 minutes long. Exactly. Yeah. Oh man, it was life changing. Is what I'm trying to say. So, uh, and as psychedelic music and rock and roll embraced uh, their own sort of little flavor of Indian music and sitar and and all kinds of drone music started happening. This is like completely my world. Hmm. And it was only later that I started figuring out th that I was going to try to embrace like moving harmony, <laughs> uh, so called like uh, you know serious harmonic information which still isn't really all that natural to me i think i'm a complete drone person mm, uh, interesting wow okay I just listen to um, like one note for a very very long time and and especially if it's not me soloing then i definitely don't want to hear that mm, you know? interesting you say that <laughs> oh okay sometimes i do i mean sometimes it's been okay is like what i should say but but oh my god the last few years it just gets harder it doesn't get easier I'm just like really I just don't want to hear I have to get the right situation going if I'm playing with Julian Lodge for example I'm actually yeah I wanted to say that yeah very free and very relaxed and and I have a feeling a lot of people say this about playing with Julian but in in the case of our duo specifically there's just some sort of weird and wondrous inexhaustible kind of chemical thing that happens and so I can't play like that with anybody else. <laughs> it's like, um, it just doesn't, I have I have virtually no inhibitions as far as what ideas I try when I play with Julian. We just, he inspires me to go as far as I can go, mm -hmm. but also limited the palette, uh, the sonic palette um, by issuing all effects pedals and things like that when we play duo. And yeah. that's very liberating as well. Um, in the quartet, in the Nels Klein Four, so called, uh, yeah, we had some a little bit of overdrive, you know, a little compressor, maybe a little reverb, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but also, once again, ba music based on those individuals in my mind, anyway, you know. I mean, initially, the quartet with Julian and me, and uh, we ended up being with Tom and Scott Colley oh, on the recording, yeah. um, was really the idea of. The idea was to have it be co-led, you know, just it would just be an extension of our duo with a rhythm yeah. section. But it just became too complicated to try to identify it and with with people's record labels and all this kind of stuff. So basically just became my thing. Uh, and then I just wrote the music for yeah. those people, you know. No, but it's beautiful. You mentioned Ju Julian. You, you know, I listened to Room today and it's... Uh. I, I I don't know, I, I, kind of like this Ralph Towner's John Abercrombie. Oh, totally. I mean, from my perspective. came into my ear, you know, like, because, and you, how you play. And it's like, and him also, Julian, you know, he plays so different than on his records with you. It's like, really like, man, where does this come from? You know, I love well, the, that. The, so. playing, the playing on Room, in Julian's case, I think harkens to his earlier, earliest records, you know, when he yeah. was playing the 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 Linda Manser guitar and 
um, it was just a different thing when he when he started embracing the Telecaster and he started like his own trio. Uh, yeah, he, I think he had a realization about what kind of language he wanted to explore, uh, not just sonically or compositionally, but also uh, uh, just kind of emotionally. I guess it's it's pretty upbeat. Um, I mean, Julie's just an incredible human. Oh, man, yeah. yeah. But, but for me, definitely, like, the, the town of Abercrombie thing is always going to be there. I mean, that was just, it, I saw those guys play duo many times and was uh, friendly with those guys because I was, like, a complete um, nervous nerd, always, like, trying to talk to, the, to my heroes but also being too scared, uh, which is kind of like a weird passive aggressive thing if i look back on it you know what i mean it's like i'm standing there trying not to be noticed yet i'm being super noticeable standing there you know <laughs> looking super needy and geeky you know um and they were really nice to me <laughs> so uh, i mean they kind of poked fun at me a couple of times because i was just so incredibly awkward but but um at the same time obviously i wasn't going away i was going to stand there and bug them <laughs> so yeah that that language is 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 crucial but also so many guitar duos i mean just even if you think of jazz guitar duos it's that information is really really in my head because i've listened mm. to so many of those like the, the john schofield john abercrombie record is fantastic Sol solar yeah. that one man that's killing that's got some rhythm section stuff on it too but yeah. but also uh uh like um oh you know well in los angeles i would hear joe pass and herb ellis who were just such a fantastic duo um uh uh joe puma and chuck wayne duo uh i used to listen to all this stuff um mm. in the 70s particularly when there was there were lots of recordings like this and and people were actually willing to put them out so yeah you know <laughs> you could buy a lot of recordings of duets you know and i love duo stuff mm. uh, acoustic bass and any instrument you know duo I'm, I'm i'm down you know i just i love duos uh it's like and, ron carter and jim hall you know those those ones well, like, yeah, that's course. amazing right actually chris chris lightcap and i play receipt please when we play duo really oh wow, the, man. The loan together record yeah 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 that that record you could tell they were playing so softly that you you can't get the audience out of the mix they're like barely playing uh it, it's like ne one half a db <laughs> yeah it's it's scary <laughs> how, how when, I quiet it, when i first heard it, it was a new record and it was just this kind of like you know rock and roll uh, refugee you know uh coming out of uh you know blues rock and psychedelic yeah. rock and then uh getting interested in progressive rock and jazz and what was later called fusion um you know uh these kinds of sonic entities are etched like you know deeply in there and i feel like i still just mine the same stuff over and over again since since those days that i was first first absorbing these things you know yeah uh i'm not sure my aesthetics is all that different i mean it's definitely uh and i'm, I'm sorry i'm getting all over the place now. no no please no, no, i love it i love, I love it just... okay but I mean, certainly hearing Sonic Youth for me was was a huge deal. And 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 uh and I was following the scene to some extent in the, the now what we might call indie rock or whatever, or or no wave or whatever all these terms that you know I was following this music, but uh DNA stood out at that time before I Sonic Youth. Uh and then and then Sonic Youth really changed my conception of uh what i wanted to do with the guitar uh, you know sound wise um and how to incorporate that into my also deep love of something like let's say the john schofield trio with steve swallow and adam oh, wow. Huspo, what i mean so this is kind of how my uh world becomes really mixed up um but that's kind of what i ended up trying to do with my first trio and i guess moving beyond with the singers you know yeah, but that's what made it original, I think, also, right? I mean, be because many guitarists of your generation <laughs> followed, you know, this John McLaughlin, Al Miola vibe that was happening, obviously, in the 70s. Well, you started oh, with, uh, when I see your first records, you, you did like Vinnie Goli and Tim Byrne and Julius uh, Hemphill, and like you went okay. completely other way, actually. 
that has a lot to do with Alex as, as well, mm. honestly, because Alex was already playing with these guys. And in the case of Tim's early records, he uh, Alex basically uh, picked the p- players for Tim for those records. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Okay. Tim, Tim felt that nobody in New York would play with him. Um, and Alex had met Tim when he was playing with Julius Hemphill. Yeah. Uh, and, and Tim was kind of like, uh, uh, you know, Julius kind of yeah. you know, assistant or whatever, student, all these different things. And uh, and when we met Vinny, that was through our friend Lee Kaplan, who I worked in the record store with and went to high school with, and he played in our high school band. Uh, hmm. He met Vinny and was, said, you guys have to meet this guy. He, you know, he knows Anthony Braxton and Chick Corea, and he plays saxophone. And we're like, oh, my God, we have to find this man immediately. Because we were listening to, you know, Anthony Braxton and, you know, uh, uh, all this ECM stuff. And, yeah. and um, we were listening to a lot of the Incas, uh, Topography of the Lungs, uh, Lee had bought it on sale yeah. in the import bin. And that was a, a really, it wasn't an emotional experience to listen to it, but it was certainly like a, an ear opening experience. Uh, um and so our palace be- becoming very broad, uh, at least in our minds. You know what I mean? Um, and yeah. Vinny comes along, <laughs> and, you know, and then we immediately just started hanging out with him. But Vinny was at our house, my parents' house, where I was living in the little back room in my parents' house. He was there like, I don't know, like at least four nights a week, just hanging out with us. And, you know, we would be jamming and then he'd stay for dinner and then he'd drive home back out to the San Fernando Valley and then we ended up, yeah, like Alex started playing with Vinny, started playing, Alex started playing with all these people. But I mean, the thing to know about Alex is that he didn't ever want to make a living playing music. Really? Um, oh, okay. Yeah, because he just doesn't, uh, he didn't want to put that pressure on it, on his life, really. And and also he doesn't really like hubbub, he doesn't really like hanging out. Um he just likes music that he likes. And so he just wanted to kind of try to make sure that's all he's doing. He's retired now from working at UCLA uh, in the oral history program. But uh, so that's what he was doing besides his own records and some, and gigs in, in mostly in Los Angeles or Orange County, but, uh, or San Diego, I guess. Anyway, Alex, Vinny, and I started just, messing around and playing all the time like all week <laughs> you know oh, yeah. it's just it was around and so and also we had alex and i had this this improvising trio doing kind of like space music uh right before that uh called spiral synthesizer guitar and drums percussion alex you know always had this massively huge setup and had all these bells and gongs and it's very inspired by the people i mentioned earlier um frank perry and uh, Pierre Favre, but also Don Moyet, Art Ensemble yeah. of Chicago, and um, God, like countless people. Like we were, li- we were listening to, you know, Tony Oxley and and um, all these guys, you know, Han Benink, obviously. Uh, oh, really? European? So this was, wow, okay. Yeah, because this we're, we're now completely fascinated by the import uh, record weirdo scene, you know what I mean? It's like... Uh, so we're listening to Tristan Hansinger. You know? Sure, man. I, I played with him. Yeah, I know. Yeah, right. It's okay. Well, well, I would never have imagined meeting anyone who even knew who he is wow. back then. You know, which is yeah, just, sure. But once again, I want to say that emotionally, I wasn't. A lot of this music wasn't really particularly moving to me, uh, but it was incredibly interesting. Like if if you could hear. I remember there was a, a a record. I don't remember who put it out. If it was like ICP or. It was, it was, I don't know, if, I hope I'm saying this name even close to correctly, but it was the bassist Merton von Richteren Altena. Oh, yeah, yeah, and, sure, sure. Yeah, I love that guy, man. He was... I think it was duo with Tristan Hansinger, but basically it sounded like people like splintering wood. That's like basically all it sounded like for about <laughs> minutes to me. And I just thought it was absolutely great, but I wasn't really, you know, moved to tears. Um, and so when I moved to tears, I'm hearing something like the beginning of the Durafle, uh Requiem, you know, or something like that. Yeah. You know, there's where harmony and sonic qualities of orchestration Melody, all come together in this way. That, 
Deep uncontrollably, um, which can also happen if I'm listening to Sonic Death. You know, the Sonic Youth live cassette. Yeah. yeah, that's, yeah. That can bring you to tears, too. <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay, well, you know what? It's time for... Uh, uh, I'll be right back. Refill. So, you can so, ask so. me... In a, you okay, ask okay. I think it may be important to note that that while I was very, I feel now, especially listening to my earlier work, very ambitious in terms of what I was trying to accomplish musically. Um, I don't know if I've ever been particularly driven to have a, I don't know, an impact or a career or something. Um, uh, it's weird. Interesting. Um, but of course I wanted to just play music. That's all I wanted to do was to not have a job anymore <laughs> sure. and 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 play music and eventually it took forever but eventually i did i was able to do that but that wasn't until like 1998 was when i first uh well that's when the last time i had a day job yeah well 1998 so about 18 years of yeah you know have, have work but all you know no it wasn't like i was in an office you know no, I, mean? sure. I had super cool jobs like working in the record store and the bookstore you know you mentioned angelica before and i did also like how did that one happen actually when uh, when did you realize okay i'm, I'm gonna do a record under i mean i, I know you did the other quartet music you know with jeff and alex and eric like way before early 80s but like how did like angelica actually happen like okay i'm gonna put out a record on my name and what did that mean for you Oh boy! Well, I mean, initially Vinny was going to put it out on Nine Winds. Oh yeah. So he was there through the sessions, but but then he basically ran out of uh, capital, shall we say? And I had no place for my record. And Tim was the one who uh, uh, introduced me to Matthias Winkelmann at uh, Enya. Enja, yeah. Okay, Enja, and. Uh, I really just was making it as part of this triptych I was describing earlier and uh, intending to, as you can see, every <laughs> every song on the record is dedicated to yeah, somebody. To Dino Saluzia yeah, or Vinny, yeah, Angel, yeah. Angel of Death, which is a really great way to open a record, right? Angel of Death. But anyway, um, it was definitely a statement in the sense that uh, I wanted to reference not only the people that the songs are dedicated to, who are all musicians, including Vinny, um, but I was trying to say something about myself, I guess, and about my aspirations, but I also wanted to use it as a, a as kind of bedrock for future work. Mm -hmm. In okay. other words, if I was go off into a complete um, pounding electric guitar post sonic youth noise realm i wanted to make it clear that my aesthetic is is coming from somewhere else as well and so it was supposed to be sort of these releases were developmental um and and pointing arrows to whatever my actual at that time aspirations were mm. uh my mind what I, what it could become which i was really at that time in my mind pretty close to some sort of i don't know now i, I can make it sounds glib if i say this or like i'm joking i'm kind of not but it also doesn't say enough but it's like would it be the combination of you know sonic youth uh the john schofield trio or the john yeah, Orchestra, the <laughs> or the mahavishnu orchestra or whatever and uh, uh um you know, I don't even know. Uh, something really monolithic, something less jazz, you know, and something really, really uh, absorbing on an overtone level. Yeah. So that's where I thought I was going, I think, at the time, ideally. Mm -hmm. um, I really, in my mind, even now, uh, always imagine to 
well, not in every instance, but for a lot of this music, two guitars. So oh, really? um, oh, okay. it's really hard for me to play just power trio, quote unquote, you know, guitar, bass, drums, uh, and be satisfied with the sound because I want everything to resonate a, and a little bit more, you know, mm. to ring a little differently. It's like two, you know, there are almost n never too many guitars for me. <laughs> Oh, wow. Okay. That's cool. I mean, obviously it has to be organized. We have to yeah, pass yeah, sure. individuals, but it's a sound that uh, I find consistently enchanting, you know, and it's just why a lot of uh, sort of purist rockers uh, have surmised that the sound of rock and roll was ruined forever when everyone started using tuners on stage. And I, I can't really ex entirely disagree with that, even though Actually I'm true. a slave yeah. to, yeah. you know, um, because the chiming of, uh, in the case of Sonic Youth, they, they very intentionally had their tunings, you know, with a lot of like cool overtones and beats. Yeah. Um, and then they beat the shit out of their guitars, which made them out of tune anyway. So it was a great sound. Um, uh, but I don't know. I, I think that that chorusing, and those overtones and harmonics that come out yeah. are just transporting. Yeah. Forever. So I always so I always have done on my records, they're not really jazz records because uh well some of them are, like uh I guess my my record of Andrew Hill's music. Yeah, yeah that's um, a beautiful one. Yeah, yeah. That's a beautiful one. Yeah. I don't remember doing any post production <laughs> wonders on that. But I like to layer things or I like to have uh, like sonic backdrops that are just subtle that sit back behind the track to put like fairy dust on it or something, you know, yeah. some kind of uh, aura of mystery or sonic wonder, you know. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not really that much of a jazz, jazz guitarist, you know, I'm really kind of producing these records to uh, have a certain effect that that I enjoy. Um I hope, you know, I think a great example of what I'm thinking of right now is the song I wrote. On, uh, it's on um, uh, The Giant Pin by the mm -hmm. Nels Klein singer. Yeah. Uh, the Ballad of Devin Hoff, yeah. which yeah, is yeah, yeah. An, an open tuning. Um, and I just think has really good layering, you know, of this one guitar. It's just this this Hagstrom guitar and an open tuning. But uh, but I, the, the production you know, and Rich Breen, who recorded those records in uh, Los Angeles, you know, did such a fantastic job recording and mixing. I think he recorded, mixed, and mastered all of them uh, up to Macroscope. Yeah. The, 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 you know, speaking of orchestration, uh, are you playing? Would you consider doing like an orchestra record also? Or, I mean, did you ever consider writing for an orchestra or like uh, well, arranging not stuff or? The closest I'll ever get to that is the Lovers record. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I, and I was always going to be the one to do all the orchestrations for that record, and I just never was able to start with any confidence. Mm. There were some very specific ideas of mine that Michael Leonard, who ended up doing it, my our, our friend Michael, who's an incredible yeah. uh, musician on many levels, uh, a lot, you know, those were specific ideas of mine that like on cry want, for example, the Jimmy yeah. Jufri is very specific. I had that idea in my mind, that orchestration for 20 some years, but the other stuff, especially my own pieces, I had no idea like how I would even start. Yeah. So I, yeah. I leave it to the experts, just like mastering, you know, yeah, yeah. or just trying to find bass frequencies that trans translate everywhere on a recording. It's like, I, I have no idea how to do that. I leave it to the, to the experts. Um, <laughs> Cheers to that. <laughs> so, so the orchestral thing, no, it doesn't really attract me. If anything, like what attracts me is like the smaller, the better. Mm. Like I wish I could play gigs uh, at the at the uh, intimacy, volume and intimacy, intimacy level uh, of say the Jimmy Jufri three um, yeah. with, Jim, with Jim Hall and various bass players. Yeah. Or, and I can't really even do that because I, it'll be too quiet. The world will drown it out, you know. So, um, and then I have this raging thing that's completely the opposite 
aesthetic that is very natural to me, which is like really, it's it's pretty, I guess, extreme uh, for somebody who likes really quiet music. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. I don't know. No, 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 it makes sense. Yeah, makes sense. Interesting. It's, it's like, just hard to do it. It's hard to do it all, Samo. I, I, I really want to, though. I know, but you, 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 I, I think when, when when I check your discography or you know what you've done, it's you're really like, you know, you're you're so diverse. I think I think people just that's why I really wanted to talk to you because of this other side of you that people many don't know actually. Like you know, when I talk to guitarist friends of mine who know you everyone knows Wilco and I'm like man but this guy has done you should check out all these other impro avant-garde Thurston Moore duos Elliot Sharp whatever Tim Burns stuff right, right. <laughs> it's the same guy and it's like ah come on. you know it's <laughs> and that's amazing you know that, that you're so diverse and it's it's well I, I won't lie I mean the pressure of trying to survive in California um playing the music that I was playing was pretty intense. And so that's why I had day jobs. And then after that, just this very sad, uh, stressful, you know, <laughs> uh, years of, of, you know, meager finances and yeah, big, sure. big dreams. <laughs> so, uh, and I, you know, I've been offered a couple of, of things that I guess had, would, been lucrative or or something you know but but wilco was the i just there's no way i could say no to wilco sure. i had to do it uh i needed rescuing but also i knew it would be cool and now sure. this month uh it's my 19th year already oh shit man wow I so dig that it's crazy um and yeah we have, we're having a really good time yeah, but even, see, that's what I find fascinating. Even though you're with Wilco, you've done so many amazing records on the side. M many guys would be just like, you know, like, okay, I'm doing this gig. and Well, I, I think I got really lucky. Uh, well, there's so much I could say about this. Um, you know, the first thing would be to say that I'm not sure that after a certain point in my life that I wanted to be playing my own music all the time. You know, I, I don't know if I believed in it enough or I didn't know if I, I don't know. It was just, it seemed untenable. Um, and, and maybe I was wrong about that. But, uh, but the other thing I wanted to say is that I got really lucky because uh, one of my best friends in the world, one of the greatest people anyone would ever know, uh, Mr. Jeff Gauthier, Mm -hmm, uh, sure. put out all these records of mine um basically letting me do anything i wanted and and uh in this beautiful packages and you know and he lost his insane amount of money doing this but uh but it definitely was uh i mean i had a few records out before that yes but it was a um, incredible way to I don't know, document my ideas. Uh, I mean, I really uh, got to try a lot of different things. And and I guess if you think about it, it also created the illusion that I was actually doing okay <laughs> playing all my own music all the time, which I was not. But did you tour like in the 90s or 2000s in Europe with the singers? Or uh, what was the first time in Europe actually for you? Well, the first time I played in Europe of uh, playing my own music, that was just a few years ago. Really? Oh, wow. With the singers, with the singers. yeah, because the, well, I, I remember people gasping at Saulfeld and yeah. when I uh, was on stage, I believe, with the singers and said that the last time I had been at Saulfeld and was 27 years ago. Wow. And those people, people went like, <clears throat> and that, that was with Julia's. Uh, Julius Hemphill in 1984. Really? Oh, man. So I didn't go to Europe and play at all. I mean, I went there with uh, these tiny tours with Mark Isham and the Silent Way Project. Yeah. Um, we played in Europe. Um, but I didn't do my own music until that singer's tour. And then wow. Julian and I also toured up right after the singer's tour. We to toured duo all over Europe. Yeah. Julian and I did a lot of duo touring actually i i saw you at the supposed duo gig in ljubljana when you did solo actually oh god because oh my god. that was the first <laughs> yeah julian was like 
it was like a flight delay, right, or something. Oh my god, that was like a, such a nightmare for me. I can't even tell you. That's like me playing solo guitar with no effects, and also having just gotten off of a, a flight. You know, it was beautiful. It was so intimate, man. It was really. <sighs> It's like listening to Frizzell, you know, like really. So like, Bill, no, because Bill is such a fantastic solo guitar player. But but so did but there was an interview I did after that gig. Was that you? No, 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 no. Was it okay? No. I remember doing I had to do an interview after the show. I oh, really oh shit. Okay. I was I was so fried, man. I can't I mean I completely forgot about this until now. <laughs> yeah, Julian uh his flight was canceled or something. Yeah 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 wow i forgot all about that jesus another time julie and i had a duo gig was in uh, um uh burlington vermont and Ooh, in this beautiful. small church this really beautiful little small church and julian came down with like real flu like influenza and was in the er motion oh, sure. what is it the er he was yeah he was in the er and so I had to start basically. He say offered people their money back, like Julian's not going to be here, and I have to play, do the same thing, play my Barney Soul jazz box into a lunchbox amplifier, tiny little amp, and and just like, and I'm not one of these guys that knows a bunch of songs to play by myself. Like Julian could play probably like 400 songs and then and reinvent them at the same time. You know, and I'm just like, oh God, what the fuck is the next chord? And <laughs> uh, uh, really, but it, actually, that show went really well. But I didn't teach me anything because my terror of playing solo is never abated. It's it's, a, it's like an absolute nightmare for me. Really, I, I wouldn't think so. I mean, wow, okay, yeah. interesting. Anyway, I'm gonna have to rethink my. Uh, it's like my lifelong phobias: uh, solo guitar playing and and music uh sight reading <laughs> but uh, speaking of julian uh now how did you connect with julian did he co uh, contact you or did you him like how did you guys hook up really, like really it was through jim hall oh really uh, yeah i um well and really brian camelio because brian camelio uh artist share records uh he's a guitar player and he kind of he kind of was almost managing Jim in Jim's later years, kind of just helping out. And uh, and so he got interviewed for the documentary that the uh, Australian lady, whose name escapes me right now, um, was made about Bill Frizzell. Hmm. And so she had just interviewed Brian. And when Brian sent these artist share discs along with her, when she interviewed me for the movie, uh when in the west village where i was living then um and uh one of them was the duo and quartet thing with jim and bill that he put out on artist share yeah um, and and then i got his info you know through the filmmaker i'm sorry i can't think of her name now um and he invited me to what he was calling the crony lunches with jim and his friends Mm. you get Jim out of the apartment and they're at the end of my block where I was living. I mean, literally a half a block away. That's cool. And uh, he said that Jim had read, he and Jim had read this piece I, I did for, now I can't remember if it was Jazz Times or Jazz Is, but I think it was Jazz Times, uh, you know, 10 tracks by an artist that, of your choice. And um, and I had chosen Jim Hall and wrote about these 10 tracks and that Jim and uh, Brian had enjoyed it. And, and so you should come to one of these, some of these lunches, you know, it's at the end, it's, it's in your neighborhood, blah, blah, blah. So when I was finally not on tour, uh, I attended more than one crony lunch um, and would always hear this name like julian 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 they're always talking about julian this julian the gym's talking about julian everyone's like i'm mean, who's this julian guy they keep talking about <laughs> so i got his name and i went uh and he was never there although because he was not available but uh, until later um but i went i remember going back and youtubing is i guess is a verb now yeah um, exactly <laughs> 
Julian and looking at this stuff online and just and, and at that point he's like 22 23 24 years old I think he was 24 when I met him but and I I'm like could not believe what I was hearing and seeing and finally Julian showed up at one of these crony lunches and uh it's I have to say the rest is history he's, he's from California we started hanging out we, he went up up the street we played some he tried a guitar of mine uh we nerded out and and jim was a block away so um that's how i met julian and then mm. you know holly would be there steve laspina kate yeah. Shoot, yeah. john pondell uh sometimes uh dave Vinny would come by or, or really uh, oh wow okay you know, uh, chris potter um man uh adam rogers you know it was yeah so that's how i met julian you, um, did you got, did you get to play with Jim then also or no no but Julian was playing with him then and so they were at the Blue Note like ah. the, the, when I first met Julian he was in town and then they played at the Blue Note and I went a couple of times and heard it, Scott and uh, Joey Barron and Julian and Jim you know yeah, yeah. it's amazing I could just walk eight blocks and go check that out yeah that's amazing man. wow that's but anyway that's how it, that's how I met Julian and we, and then we. And I was super fried on touring and on myself. And like, I get tired sure. uh, myself sometimes. So I was in a weird space when I met Julian. He basically rescued uh, that and going to hear music. Just mm -hmm. other people, they really rescued me. It was, it's so easy to do in New York City, right? Oh my God. But but uh, uh, we just started improvising. Um, I had this idea that I wanted to see if he would want to play with me in a cellist um mm, well. and uh because i'd done so many guitar duos i was trying not to do a guitar duo <laughs> um because i played duo well, you mentioned thurston and yeah, Elliot, yeah. Elliot, yeah. jeremy drake g.e stinson uh god it's like and i mean of course i love i played i am recorded with rebo but we played duo uh anyway um and then at the last minute this gig that uh, uh i was going to play a uh, kind of benefit gig um the cellist couldn't make it uh, we had not even played with the cellist yet and uh and i remember asking julian like said look should we just soldier on and do it as a duo and he said yeah and that was it you know yeah it was uh one of the greatest things that ever happened in my life musically especially i guess it's beautiful oh you guys yeah it's you know hope we can do it again someday it's so hard to schedule oh yeah i can imagine i can imagine i wanted to ask you just about you said in a sense you get sick of what you played like how, how do you keep fresh on a tour let's say a jazz tour i, I did like a three-week jazz tour in october last year and after seven days, I was sick of myself, not of the other musicians. Oh yeah, well, I thought I'm re repeating myself all the time, and I was I had this crisis. How do you keep it up, actually? That you're sound fresh. Look at what I, look what I do. I don't keep fresh. I don't even tour <laughs> playing that music. I tour with Wilco. You know, I mean, I I don't know if if I would become really a badass if I confronted what you're talking about every night, night after night after night, mm. or uh, if if I would just like end up feeling like you're feeling sometimes, mm. you know, just saying like, Oh my God, it's like, I, I just need to stop. You know, <laughs> this is, this is, you know, um, but on the other hand, that would never happen if I was playing with Julian, for example, you know, yeah. or, yeah. Uh, you know, there, there was just, and we didn't have a huge repertoire. We were playing basically the same songs, but they had enough space That's for us to point. change. And also, uh, just a lot of free playing because that's what we like doing as i think that's kind of the coolest thing we do is just make shit up um because it's so incredibly rewarding like it sounds so yeah. composition and it's and it's never the same and i remember when i first started touring as a duo wondering if this chemistry had a shelf life you know so to speak um and could be if it could be exhausted somehow and apparently it can't be um which was absolutely like delightful a delightful realization <laughs> yeah, yeah definitely yeah um, yeah you know but yeah I, I but soloing you know oh my god 
you know, the jury, <laughs> jury's still out. The jury's still out on soloing. <laughs> That's, it makes me more relaxed to hear you say that. <laughs> Actually, then I'm like, okay, there's still hope. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, there's always hope, right? I mean, <laughs> no, no, no. and the other thing is that I do get periodically, in, like, inspired, uh, surprised. Um, and... Uh, and and I don't feel daunted, but I generally feel daunted, right? Just go like, wow, you know, like, why do I think I can do that? Or why do I want to do that when I know that that it's like really somebody else's thing, but I Ooh. just got to know, I somehow have to have to know. Uh, and it's mostly happens with jazz guys, you know, like I'm listening to jazz so-called uh, guitarists and um well, certainly Jim Hall comes to mind, but also Wes. Yeah. For, yeah. And, and, you know, it's just, just basically a freak of nature situation. Um, just mind-bendingly musical and, yeah. and original and, and technically astonishing. Um, George Benson is another one very big for me. Really? Oh, wow. uh, okay. Uh, yeah, I fucking love George Benson, man. Really? I, it's not, I'm not talking about, you know... Oh yeah, I think "Give Me the Night" is my favorite song. Okay, so so just "Give Me the Night" is what it is. It's a disco song, and that's George Benson, the pop star. But oh my God, his guitar playing, Giblet Gravy, that stuff, the early stuff. <laughs> um, well, yeah, I mean the cookbook and all that, but yeah. but uh, his feel, his tone, his it's the fleetness, the fleetness of his. Uh, uh, oh man, it's just exhilarating to me, you know. And I used to listen to a lot of Pat Martino. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, anyway, I could go on and on and on. And also what I have to say, conversely, Fred Frith is extremely important to me. Really? And, oh. oh, my God. Yeah. Huge. Yeah, I love his stuff. You know, he's one of those underrated visionaries, definitely. Yeah. I remember listening to the first Henry Cow record when it was new because we were like prog rock geeks and and being really interested in that that scene that ended up happening with art bears and uh, yeah. all the music that came out of that. But then guitar solos, that record. Yeah, that was, that was really huge. Um, and then following massacre, uh, yeah. having heard massacre live um, at that time was really huge for me. They were played at the whiskey go, go. I remember I, le I lent Fred, my speaker cabinet. I had, this Mitchell speaker cabinet and the presenter wanted, they were cobbling together gear for this gig. And I remember Bill Laswell playing like the amp was complete fuzz. There was, there was no clean tone whatsoever. He played with a drumstick a lot on the bass. It was, I, I just thought it was such a great, it was so intense. It was a great show. Um, well show, you know, yeah. it was a great set. Um, so it's really hugely influential. I mean, I think a lot of why music like Sonic Youth and of that, what was happening at that scene was an interest to me was because of having heard Derek Bailey and Fred Frith and Keith Rowe and, really? and well, okay. having, having thought about the guitar in completely different ways um, at the same time thinking that, oh yes, of course, I'm going to be able to play like, you know, uh, George Benson or, or Howard Roberts or, or you know, uh, um, God, who were some of my other big favorites at that point, you know, besides the fusion guys, you know, we now call them fusion guys. Yeah. yeah. You know, I'm a Glofflin. My brother was the Mahavishnu complete fanatic, but I have to say that for me, um, like extrapolation, all the oh, stuff my. he did with all the stuff he did with miles, uh, Tony Williams lifetime um and his acoustic work um and with Shakti uh all that music that would have been enough to like extremely like obliterate uh, eclipse almost anything else I had thought about at the time because I'm of course fascinated with Indian classical music and now he's swimming in that world uh and holding his own you know um so yeah mclaughlin is like super huge super huge uh, the aesthetics of the records you know it's kind of like jeff beck i hate to say yeah. bad 
But the aesthetics of a lot of the records don't appeal to me uh, after a while, though they didn't after a while, but but the level of accomplishment is still so astonishing to me that, I mean, it's just the degree of respect. And, and I have complete awe of these people, you know. Um, John McLaughlin yeah. has but accomplished you... so many different things and yeah. continues to explore the parameters. Well, now he has his arthritis is sidelined, him, but... Uh, you know, this is the kind of the thing when when I came across him, it was at a crucial time. You know, I'd have to say that as a, like an 18, 19 year old coming across, or actually before that, coming across John McLaughlin, I guess 71, I was a 16. Mm. So the first time I really started listening to him, I don't, I don't know, but um, it's it's just incredibly important. Just the way he would comp on these, on these Miles records, on yeah. Bitches. The stuff he plays, you know, and his tone at that time is very important. Anyway, and for me, I'm, extrapolation it's like one of the best records. I well, mean, so, like, you know, really. okay, so well, I agree. Um, you know, he used to always cite Gabor Zabo as uh, mm -hmm. an influence and as a favorite, and I was never a big Gabor Zabo guy, and it wasn't until Jeff Parker was surprised that I wasn't a big Gabor Zabo guy and he loves Gabor, uh, that I went back and started reinvestigating. And I realized that, of course, I always loved, um, well, of course, <laughs> of course, of course, by Charles Lloyd Quartet with Gabor. And I realized that's, I think, I can hear extrapolation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His guitar on, of course, of course, and then I, I heard I heard the, the influence. I made the correlation uh because john mclaughlin's you know his technique is so completely freaky beyond what gabor ended up doing on the guitar he chose a different path after of course of course yeah. and what we call now i guess raga jazz or something you know i didn't i didn't take those records seriously at the time i thought they were kind of corny um and now i love them <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you jim parker <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> no, it's not not to take more of your time. I just I just first to ask you what what's on the schedule for 2023. But mm. uh, one Wilco question I have to ask you because there's one solo I teach all the students. It's not impossible Germany, but it's either way. And oh, and for me that's one of the best. You teach the solo? Oh man, I love that. This is this is one of the best solos I've heard ever. Like, how did you come up with that one? Is it, was it completely improvised or like, did you kind yeah. of, yeah? It was, it was, but I did think about it. All right, I mean, I did have to say, I took some runs at it. Okay. But, but, oh my God, this is just, <laughs> I could never get away with playing a solo like that and we'll go again. <laughs> um, it was like my first studio record. Yeah, exactly. With the. It was at a time when, when the, you know the the collaborative the, the collaborative energy uh, uh, was really huge on that record. I mean, it was really like everybody had a lot of ideas, and there was a lot of input, and there was a mm -hmm. lot of things around and rethinking things. And either way, huge record for Jeff at the. I mean, huge song for Jeff coming out of. Uh, at that time, he came out of rehab. Uh, uh, hospital and we started working and I think that song is uh, like a kind of affirmation you know like a life affirming uh, like a life raft or something mm -hmm. and it's this beautiful yeah. song the word the harmonic information man we went around and around and around with those chords like which would also probably never happen in a Wilco song again but um and so I was just hearing it as, uh, you know, I, I don't want to demean your your uh, impression of it by telling you what I thought of it as. No, no, no. <laughs> but now it's, you'll never, get, you'll never get these words out of your head. Um, it was basically supposed to be my sort of tribute to uh, George Benson and Pat Matheny. Okay. Um, okay. You know, it's okay. coming out of a Benson and Matheny mindset. I'll listen uh, now again after this, just to the song, actually, with this in mind. 
Well, I mean, I have to say also, speaking of Pat Metheny, like Bright Size Life is one of the most important records for me. Uh, for the time it came out, it had this huge, huge impact on me. So I know I mentioned John Schofield's and John Abercrombie's trios uh, in the course of what we've been talking about. But but Bright Size Life was uh, an incredible favorite of mine. And I mm. I had seen Pat back then with with gary burton and, and i love dreams so real that record it's yeah, a beautiful record yeah. very, very important um you know the whole i'm digressing now but uh since i was a teenager i guess late teens i got really really into uh paul blay and really wow paul blay recordings uh are incredibly important to me like the trio recordings oh. slow piano the annette peacock and carla blay compositions this is basically the material that I've played for like 40 years now, 35 years, wow. is I try to play something from that. I play an, an at Peacock piece or I play a Carla Blay piece or something or two. When I play solo, for example, I probably played a Carla Blay piece. Uh, I might have played Ida Lupino when you were there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I drop D and I go, thank God I have a drone. Anyway, uh, <laughs> uh so, oh God, you know, I've totally derailed myself talking about Paul Blay, but um, that's why every record that I've done pretty much has some floaty, weird, abstract ballad. It's my attempt at uh, writing a, a Nat Peacock kind of piece or to write a play like Paul Blay's trio would play yeah. those ballads, you know. Um, there was a time when I probably thought around the time of Angelica and before that in the 80s where... Or basically that's maybe all I wanted to do would be play pieces like that and then play pieces like uh the piece Hara on that record, which is like listening to, you know, like Eshberto Jujmachi with Charlie really? Hayden and Barbaric or oh, something man. like yeah, that. That's Magico, 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 tree. Magico, yeah, yeah sir. Sure. Very, very important music. Um Brazilian music's hugely important and we that's a whole other thing we have. Wow. It's just always lurking. It's always like there uh, because of the combination of amazing uh, harmonic and rhythmic invention, but then total freedom conceptually, you know, coming from, I guess, you know, even before the Tropicalia scene, but once psychedelia seeped in, you know, that's the most creative, yeah. vibrant, it's just so inspiring that's usually where i go for inspiration in the last many many years when i if i feel really really tired of i don't know what forms like song forms and and changes and all this kind of stuff i can reinvigorate my imagination by just going back to brazil really wow interesting wow. yeah yeah makes sense all this gels together in your mind that then then you get your music <laughs> it all makes sense now almost well it's like you know uh, uh baden powell yeah and Bola Tate, very important but also they connect to my love of ralph towner you know and ralph towner is incredibly important to me and incredibly influential i mean there's certain things that i realize come out of my playing that are uh i guess seem natural to me but they're they're influenced super influenced by specific people but they almost are kind of like they were playing what i was playing in a weird way already so they're not unapproachable it's like it's like listening to do you ever hear this guitarist uh this i had this pen pal in the 70s from sweden and then there's this swedish guitarist named stefan harda and no. he made this record and he has this like crazy pull-off technique and he's no, playing shit, a, i have to check him out he's playing a, i think he's playing a It'd be like McLaughlin and, and on Extrapolation and Gabor. I think he's playing a Dreadnought or something with a pick, really? with a D arm and pickup. Anyway, really, apparently a super weird, egotistical, like maybe kind of, I don't know what, crazy person. But anyway, so I hear that and I'm amazed, but I know that's not me, okay? When I hear uh, Tom Verlaine play, uh recorded solos say maybe on, on besides television like dream time or something like that sound his melody choices no choices mm -hmm. like I, I just do feel like there's something of myself that i responded to in it right right away 
and that yeah. can go right to that space uh even as a player the same thing has happened over the years with with certain hendrix things where i had no interest in, when I, you know, I i picked up guitar really inspired by Jimi hendrix the birds initially but then hendrix was the lightning yeah, bolt that time yeah. that transformed me um and I had no inkling of playing like Jimmy and I couldn't, I had no, I didn't even know what a scale was, you know? Uh, but then years later, <laughs> like 20, 30 years later, when I want to go there, man, I can go, I can totally go there. Uh, just like if you put a Les Paul with like 11s, yeah, in yeah. Hand, nice creamy overdrive, I can become a completely different person. And I'm bending notes and I'm playing blues stuff, which is all the Dwayne and Dickie yeah, that yeah. built in and Johnny Winter and Rory Gallagher or whatever. It just starts to leak out. Um, and sometimes I wonder when I do that, like, wow, is this what I should have been doing all this time? Because <laughs> it's so natural in a weird way. Uh, yeah. But it's not satisfying in, in terms of improvising. I like improvising sure. more than anything, you know, really. Yeah. I mean, it's nice to have songs and have these emotions in play or this kind of drama, these dynamics, these resonances, you know, all these different yeah. things. But at the end of the day, it's like, uh, I'm only relaxed when I'm improvising. Yeah. Ralph, did, did you ever like try to learn that stuff? Like harmonically, like distant hills and Aurora and all that stuff. I mean, when you were younger or. Um, well, I met Ralph. I, I did this that my incursion into his life uh probably around 1975 wow. maybe 74 yeah, wow. uh, Oregon were opening for Larry Coriel in the 11th house and at the Troubadour in West Hollywood and uh Ralph was super nice to me so I've known Ralph in my own weird fanboy way um since then and and wow. uh that's how it end up like backstage at Oregon gigs or backstage at with his duo gigs with John Abercrombie. And uh, I don't know. I was like, so in awe of these people and, and um, uh, I don't know how, how to explain what I know or don't know. I think most of what I know about Ralph's music, I learned from my uh, musical partner for many years, Eric Von Essen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Eric was a multi-instrumentalist and he understood so many of the, well, all pretty much all, I would say, the intricacies of music and particularly that music. And, and later he became a like, first call jazz bass player in yeah. Los Angeles and, and understood that music inside out, uh, the music of so-called, you know, standards or the American songbook or whatever you want to call it. And, um, and we used to call these chords like Ralph chords or uh, like, or we used to call them like uh, Byrak chords. You yeah. Know, slash slash chords. times, slash times with slash. and <laughs> Exactly. And, and Richie Byrak was kind of like the king of that harmonic language at the time because it was so extreme how many of these, the chords he was using in his music, but it was of course <laughs> absolutely captivating. And uh, to me anyway, um, and so, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, a song like Distant Hills, I didn't understand what was going on harmonically at all. I just knew I loved that whatever was happening. Well, I, yeah, yeah. And so sometimes I find later that I'm discovering the same thing that is, say, like the Distant Hills thing, for example, because I've decided to drop to E flat or something. Oh, no, maybe. But, but uh, 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 it's just something i love to hear it's like a, it's a sound that i yeah. uh, you can hear actually god it's like how many records do i have that basically have my version of distant hills on them you know there's there's uh um uh as close as that yeah, yeah. Well, uh, with with that's julian cool. yeah yeah that's, that's basically uh the title uh is a reference to basically saying that like it's really really close to something else and in this case it's as close to ralph as i was going to be that day um and yeah. uh the same there's another there's a movement in a piece i did a hundred years ago in 19 
well, I don't know when it was recorded, 98, I think, uh, the ne Destroy All Nels Klein, mm -hmm. which is one of the few records of mine that I actually do listen to occasionally. And um, because it was complete, a work of complete obsession and really just for, made for me. And my I was kind of having a nervous breakdown at the time, and or almost. And um, so there's a movement in uh, both, both uh, as in life, the piece dedicated to Horace Tapscott, and then there's a song on it called The Ringing Hand. The Ringing Hand is a, a blatant Ralph tune. Mm. Uh, it's just that it has big dynamics, you know, big drums and Carla Boslich playing her and sonic sampler on this um, uh, oct octagon bell sample yeah. and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it's it's big. It's like uh, maybe more of my orchestra than uh oregon but um yeah it's just always there that's that language is it's just part of what i fell in love with about music you know mm. yeah growing up you know, listening, like listening to wayne we've lost wayne shorter now yeah and he had an incredibly beautiful full life and influenced a ton of people including yours truly so that music uh that Wayne basically played from, you know, art, not necessarily, I mean, I'm not thinking of Art Blakey's music right now. So just moving a little bit beyond that into Miles Land. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's whether I understand everything about it or not isn't even a question. What I'm saying is that it's changed the way I hear everything. Yeah, I was thinking that. You know, and, and, uh, Eric von Essen, for example, one of his his uh, it was an incredible composer, and um, Wayne Shorter became kind of his. Uh, besides the 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 language of music earlier, like um, besides the so called American Songbook or whatever, mm. but also so let's say like you know, uh, you know, kind of blue or whatever, like what. Well, Evans Trio would do, but um, no, seriously, uh, uh, he thought of Wayne as the most, um, I don't know, I wouldn't want to use an adjective that he wouldn't use, but I, I, I think of this horribly overused, in, inappropriately and inaccurately used term Zen. Yeah, yeah. There's okay. Something, there's something about these very brief, concise compositions where the harmonic information can be so incredibly vast in terms of the the potential uh to go in you know theoretically or however you want to think about it in different directions it's yeah. it's it's like the tune esp uh, in a way i mean you can't read a lead sheet and get that song you know it has sure. so much to do with a sonic universe that that these those chords are and wayne's music and sometimes it's just a few bars, you know. Um, obviously, Thelonious Monk in a completely stylistically different way is similar. You can accomplish so much with so much potential, with so many variations uh, that that could. I mean, ex variations is the right word, but can be expanded upon and go in so many different ways. Uh, and Wayne's universe was was so like that to me. Yeah. It's just so. It's so open at the same time. It's so incredibly meticulously, concisely what it is. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Now I'm rambling again. No, 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 but it's true. Uh, I know what you mean. Yeah, it was quite. I listened to some of his early Blue Note stuff these days. You know, yesterday and oh, today, check, and, man. Check out the Odyssey. Check out Odyssey of Iska. Oh sure, I, I know it. Yeah, yeah sure. Okay, okay. all the well, right. You're, you're in Slovenia. That's why you know it uh americans probably a lot of of a younger generation they don't know these records you know um and that's right when alex and i were exposing ourselves to jazz so-called and the world of improvised music and it was kind of reforming itself or re-identifying itself with to some extent i guess with pop culture by adding electric guitars and things that weren't on most of the records I listened to when yeah. I just when I heard jazz, which was to say, 
uh, John Coltrane started me on that path, you know, and then uh, and my brother getting into Miles, and then that, from Miles, everything is you basically have everything going, coming, and going. Yeah. Uh, and so there was no guitar, you know. So it's like, what am I going to do? Like, how do I play this music? It's like everybody's got a piano player, you know. Uh, my brother was so bummed out when Alex was so bummed out when he was just like getting into all these jazz guitar players because he just couldn't take the sound. He's just, <laughs> what is with this tone? It's completely dead. You know, there's no note bending, no distortion. So unexpressive, you know. Yeah. I'm putting words in his mouth now, but basically, especially Pat Martino. I remember him specifically telling me at one point that Pat Martino was a terrible influence on me. <laughs> <laughs> but I know what he meant, actually. I mean, you know. Yeah, I do too. I mean, I sure. Do it wasn't like I was in love with his tone. It was just that I was, I was absolutely dazzled by what he was playing. The lines are amazing, yeah, but the tone, yeah. I mean, you <laughs> put him. Was somebody I used to go hear a lot in the seventies. Yeah, Joe Diorio. Uh, he had a Monday night gig at Dante's and had a, oh, wow, had a quartet that played standards, but like took them like completely all over the place. And that was really influential because that was another example of of, of, a, an, of an improvising ensemble, like really re, uh, reinventing and and just uh, really playing in the moment with form. Yeah, it was like the Mick Goodrick, right, of the West Coast kind of. I guess, yeah, in a sense, of, almost. Yeah, he had a really weird. Uh, uh, he was much more idiosyncratic, I think, and as a player. But but anyway, yeah, he was um, really into his fourths thing. Um, it was kind of part of his sound. That was kind of part of Pat Martino's sound too, around that consciousness era. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw him play live that one time back then, and Pat was on another planet. Man, it was jaw dropping. It was crazy. So yeah, but I'm sure that's part of me used to think that I could maybe do that someday, which is absurd. Uh because I don't have any discipline, you know what I mean? I can't mm. just be disciplined enough. I just I don't think I ever wanted to be the best. You know what I mean? The number one top gun. <laughs> uh really much more into the aesthetics of the music. Uh and then I'm and then I'm it's incumbent upon me to do all the finger wiggling. And I still think it's important to try um, for some reason that I now don't understand. <laughs> no, come on, come on. You're too humble now. It's, uh... No, no, the finger wiggling thing is hard. It's really, really hard. Uh, I think people generally think I know things that I have no clue about. You know, I think it's, it's been a, um, an amazing uh, effort to just I think invoke just different sounds and and moods mm. with a guitar rather than to own uh, some sort of place in guitar uh, lore, you know, mm. as a guitarist, you know. I just do love guitar. I mean, certainly I'm never tired of the instrument. I never tire of the sound of people playing guitar, uh, honestly. Mm. So that's good. That's good. Yeah, no, but yeah, I mean, I, I, it's interesting what you say because you, you know, I rather listen to you or to Bill Frizzell or someone like that. I mean, in my my ears, you know, Bill Frizzell has one of the best techniques in the world. Not in a sense that he's super fast, but it's just like, you know, in, during COVID, it's real music. Yeah, you know, he can play the G chord. And then I would play the same G chord. Does. <laughs> and he plays it and he sounds amazing. And I'm just like, wow, it's the G chord. And he's like, wow. <laughs> yeah, well, he, he's, uh, you know, it's... he understands the, that G chord very well. <laughs> exactly. He knows why it's, why it, it's, G yeah. Chord. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. But cool. Now, man, uh, I, 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 I'll, I'll, leave you be a what is today a saturday a nice saturday afternoon so you i think you'll have snow to shuffle so no no the the last bit of snow that was happening most of the time we've been talking was just so wet that it's ah, okay 
<laughs> hasn't been anything. All the shoveling I did before looks intact. Uh, and so that's good because it's going to get cold and it's going to all freeze. Yeah. So, yeah. Anyway, and then what's it like where you are in Slovenia? Oh, man, we, we had like a, such a long winter. It's been snow until yesterday. And, you know, I already cut. We live in a house. We, I cut all the trees already. Last oh. week, now the freeze came again. I was like, oh, man, shit. Oh, no. And snow came and now it's slowly going up the temperature. So it's, uh, I'm sick of the winter already. <laughs> slowly, it's been long, you know. I grew up in Southern California, so and lived in Los Angeles for at least fifty years. And so traveling, of course, I would encounter winter periodically or on some sort of holiday. But now it's been part of my daily, like whatever, daily, not daily, but yearly life for several years. And it's still kind of amazing to me. So it's has a still has its own exotic quality and and a certain I hate hesitate to use this word, but purity. Uh, it does, yeah, and I find that's a very cleansing after living in uh, like heat and pollution for most of my life. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it makes sense. It's beautiful, but it's just like you know, after four months, it's like, oh, man, I need to see some green and some, you know, <laughs> slowly. Oh, we're, in the, we're in the country, so that also is a different yeah. feeling. Yeah, yeah. City yeah. winters are hard. Yeah. Right? Well, right. we moved to a house. We, we live now one year on the countryside, like five kilometers oh. from a city on the top of a hill among the vineyards. So it's beautiful, you know. It's, mm. it's, it's okay. So if spring's going to be awesome for you. Oh, man, wine, the, wine and beer. <laughs> it's, it's on the way. Yeah. All right. Well, hey, thank you so much. Now, thanks so much, man, for taking...